Our scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1. For the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have, have had consequences of sins. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, To do your will, O God. After saying above, Sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I will have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sacrificed through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily, ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time, onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected of all time those who are sanctified, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put in my law I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Good morning. Packed house today. Right? Pretty close, right? I mean, it's always, it's always the front row that are the last seats to fill. That's okay. We don't take that personally. <clears throat> but it's good to see everybody. <clears throat> if you want to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to start today in verse 19. <laughs> Julio always says that I pick on him and give him the long scripture reading. So Julio, I just took, took care of it my own self today, okay? <laughs> When we look at Hebrews chapter 10, we're going we're gonna, to, the, the reason why we're looking at this passage today is posted to my right, your left, um, our theme for the year. You see here, encourage one another in love and good deeds. In the scripture reading, I can't see it from here, but I believe it says Hebrews 10, 23 and 24. <clears throat> we're going to look at those scriptures today. Um, you look at that as it's posted, encourage one another in love and good deeds. It's a great reminder for all of us to come in to take a look at that and understand what we are trying to do. We are trying to do that because we are trying to, because we're seeking to know him and seeking to make him known. So that is, that is you know, a, a very summarized, well-designed reminder that is posted up here in, in, in the front for all of us. However, this morning what I'd like us to do is look a little deeper in, into this passage and really get into the why we are supposed to be doing this, why this is important enough to be mindful for us, not just once a week, but every day, as Phil referenced. Not just, you know, this is not, this, this should not be our theme for, you know, 52 Sundays. Uh, it should be our theme every day as we go about doing what it is that we're, that we're trying to do. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, the first word is therefore, that's why we have to have the long scripture reading, right? If you've not taken anything from anything I've ever said to you, I hope you take away this idea that if the scripture says therefore, you have to go backwards. It is a reference to what has been said before. So if you just pick up, pick up and start reading, well therefore, blah, 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 and you don't go back and know what's being said before, then you're going to get lost. It's saying, because what, what the Hebrew writer is saying here, because what I have just said is true, I'm going to say the next thing. <laughs> right? Now, whenever you see therefore, because, hence, whatever word that you may see there, that's what that's saying. <clears throat> so it says, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over 
the house of God. I'm going to stop right there. I have a problem when I communicate with people. I like to preface things. Before I say what I want to say, I say a bunch of things to try to help you understand the thing I want to say. It makes me very wordy. <laughs> I, I use a lot of words to say very little sometimes. My daughter sh shook her head there very, 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 you know, she, she did go over the top. I do appreciate that. But it's true. I use a lot of words to say very little sometimes, okay? <clears throat> I, I, I want to say it's because of the influence of Scripture on me, Dad. That's what I want to say. That, that, that's what I want to say. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I want to say. Because so far, we haven't said anything yet. <laughs> okay? Verses 19, 20, and 21 are saying that you should go back to the previous 18 verses so that we can finally get to something here in verse 23. All right? <clears throat> But let's take a look at, at, at what he's prefacing, what he's setting up. He's saying, okay, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, because of the system that has now been put in place, because we don't have to have continuing annual sacrifices. In fact, the, the, uh, the, uh, the scripture says here and before that you know, that's, not what, that's not what was pleasing. <clears throat> they had to come back and do this every year. And now, because we have a sufficient sacrifice, there's no need to do that. There's no need to come back year after year and remember the sins of the year. There's, there's no reason to reach back and think about all the bad things. Now, those are gone now because of this new sacrifice. So he's saying since we have, since this, 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 this order of the priesthood and these kind of things, since they are no more, then we have this confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. We have this new and living way which he inaugurated for us. Through the veil that is his flesh. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God. See, we have these things now because of the new system. Because of the, because of the summary that was offered in the first part of this chapter. These three things that are mentioned in verses 19, 20, and 21 are true. So he's saying, since this is true, since this happened... This is now true, so now we get to what we should do about it. And that's a lot of stuff I just referenced in about three minutes. So my advice would be to go back when we're done to read that again, because there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot here. And the point I'm trying to make here is not to, to emphasize each of those things, but all of these things that we just read are very important. And they deserve your time and meditation and focus and prayer over. <clears throat> but because of all this, verse 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Let us draw near. You see, in the, in the Jewish system that we saw instituted in the Old Testament, God did not seem very personable. There was always people who spoke to God on behalf of other people. There was kind of this system, and you had to be a certain person. Like, who you were could determine how close you could get in a conversation. You know, Moses talked to God like, you know, they had a relationship, right? But everyone didn't have that access. Everyone couldn't do that. And when, the, and when the priesthood is established, that was, that was their role. They went to God on behalf of other folks. <clears throat> but what the Hebrew writer is saying here, since, since now we have the great high priest, we have Jesus who has given access, who the veil has been torn, the veil is his flesh, is what is said here. That has been torn. Now there is no distance between us and God. There's distance in the sense that he's God and we're not. But there's not distance in the sense of we have to go through some other human being in order to have access to the Father. That is no longer necessary. Jesus has met the requirement and satisfied the requirement for that to happen. It has eliminated the need for that. He is the high priest now. 
So when we draw near to God, we should do so sincerely and in full, in full assurance of faith. <clears throat> having hearts, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see, that's the great thing about the forgiveness of Jesus. One of the problems that's mentioned in this passage that I, I just read is the idea that we have to revisit the sins for the year. All the things that I did wrong this year, I've got to kind of re revisit them in this, in this ceremony. And you see, the idea and the need for that kind of, for that kind of consciousness is now, is now gone. It's not necessary. Because we're drawing through with a full assurance of faith. <clears throat> now that we've had our hearts sprinkled clean from evil conscience and our bodies washed with, with pure water, that is not necessary. It is no longer necessary to be in that, in that state. So that's the first thing he tells us to do, is to draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith. The second thing he asks us to do in verse 23, it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. The confession is what is true. It is the things of Jesus that are being mentioned here and throughout Scripture. The things of Jesus are true. And because that is true, we should hold fast to that and not waver from that. We should hold to that. So here's the idea that we're, that we're, that we're building up to. If because all these things are true... We can draw near to God with a sincere heart and in assurance of faith. We're going to hold fast to our hope. So if we're drawing near to God and we're holding fast, unwavering, we're holding unwaveringly to what is promised of God because he it was promised from God because he is faithful, then if we do those two things, what are we now equipped to do? Nobody wants to answer. Some confused faces out there. I'll give you a hint. It's written on the side. <laughs> Kathy, <Bill. laughs> it's written on the side. You see, what we have to do is when we make a theme, we summarize. When you make a point, you try to make it short. Okay? But there's a lot loaded into that concept. What's loaded into that concept is all the things that have happened that allow Jesus to be the true and one high priest that we need. A system has become perfected. The system of, of our relationship with God. And because of that, we should draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. We should hold fast to our confession without wavering. In verse 24, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. You see, the next thing we have to do is once we, once we, once we do the, you know, once we draw near to God and we hold fast to that confession, then we have to think about how we're going to encourage and love. How we're going to help other people. Encourage and love. But I submit to you today that this is a package deal. If we find ourselves that, and we are not drawing near to God, we're not going to be very effective encouragers. If we find ourselves not holding to the confession of Christ, it's going to be tough for us to spur others to good deeds. So when we think about this, I want us to think about this in its proper context. You're not being asked, you're not being encouraged to just encourage. Because again, we've taken that word, encouragement, and in many ways we've made it so cheap. Have a good day. I just encouraged them. When you're talking about in the kind of encouragement we're talking about here in Scripture... 
You're talking about much more than a well wish. It's much more than that. Encouragement has to do with loving, caring, and supporting so that the folks that you're encouraging and loving and caring for and supporting are then stimulated to serve the Lord. That's more than a well wish, isn't it? Get well soon. That's not the kind of encouragement that we're talking about. That's fine. I appreciate you that you want me to get well. Thank you. And I mean that sincerely. I'm not making light of that. But let's not be confused and think that that is what spiritual encouragement is. It's a good thing to do, but that's not spiritual encouragement. Verse 25, not forsaking our assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, one of the other things that they had to do is they came together. They did things together, sometimes daily, sometimes every other day. But they came together. They got together. And I can tell you right now, we do live in a world of social media. We do live in a world where we're more connected than ever before. I can call you pretty much anywhere in the world. I can email you anywhere in the world. I can even FaceTime or Skype or Zoom or any one of a number of things and even see your face. And that's great. That's great. But the depth of encouragement that we're talking about oftentimes is best done face to face. It's best done so I can give you a hug, or I can shake your hand, or I can do whatever it does physically that may need to encourage you. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand here. This, this has universally been the you have to come to church verse, <laughs> right? Okay? Contextually, what this is saying is much larger than that. It's not saying, oh, you got to come to church, Hebrews 10, 25. I've heard that. <clears throat> it's bigger than that. Just because you're here doesn't mean you're encouraging me. Just because I'm here doesn't mean I'm encouraging you. Just because I'm standing in front of the microphone doesn't mean I'm encouraging you. This is come together, be together in a very real and meaningful way that encourages and spurns people to do good works. The works of the Lord. We're glad you're here. You should be here. But this is bigger than that. This is a spiritual practice, not a practical behavior. This is about doing what we can to push each other to be better. Not better by criticizing you and pointing out all the things that you do wrong. Encouraging you by saying, I love you. I'm here for you. How can I help? I, want to, I need help. I need help. I need encouragement. Please help me. That's okay too. I think sometimes we don't feel strong enough to truly encourage and we're not humble enough to ask for encouragement. And I think that's where people get lost. Is in the middle of those two places. I'm too proud to ask for help. And I'm too weak to actually help. So I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm lost in the shuffle. I'm not giving what I want to give. And I'm not getting what I need to get. And that's where we have, to, we have to stop and we have to be the people that are drawing near to God because we can do that now. We have to be the ones that are holding fast to his promises because the one who promises is faithful. We have to love and encourage and spur one another to do good works because that is where growth and, you know, Encouragement and this improvement, this becoming more like Jesus, which was a theme last year, 
By the way, it's always the underlying theme. Always. Like the Olympics. <laughs> it's every day. <laughs> right? <clears throat> That's where we find that. And it seems like we increasingly live in a world where people want to do that alone. People want to do that by themselves. And I get it. Listen, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you something, you know, to the best of my knowledge, everything I say up here is true. You know, I, you know, some may argue with that, but to the best of my knowledge, it's true. <clears throat> Dealing with people's messy. You ever had someone try to encourage you and they discourage you? <laughs> you ever had that happen? Yeah. Even better question, have you ever done that? No. That was less funny, but just as true. <laughs> it happens. It happens. It's messy. <clears throat> but that's what we're called to do. And again, it starts with the drawing near to God. That's where it starts. If we're, if we're not close to God and we start trying to encourage, that's not going to go well. If we're not close to God and we start trying to spurn people to action, that's not going to go well. And as we know, the thing that defines that, of course, is love. When you draw, I mean, God is love. That's where that is. And that's what we're asked to do. Now, Dave, why do you say that, the, that this passage is bigger than just the little things like saying nice words to people and coming to the building at 10 o'clock? Well, why do you say it's bigger than that? Well, we're not going to read this, but if you keep going, the reason why we're doing that is because we're trying to end sin. <laughs> we're trying to stop sin's reign in our lives and the lives of people. That's the whole purpose of drawing near to God, holding to the confession, coming together, you know, being a part of each other's lives, helping each other, encouraging each other, helping people do good things. Because ultimately we're trying to stay on the path that was laid out and established by Jesus and not waver off and wander off onto our own path, which is none of those things. You know, that, that path is self-centered, is selfish. It's how can everyone encourage me? How can everybody do good things for me? How can everybody make me feel the way I want to feel, be the way I want to be, do the things I want to do? <clears throat> be perceived the way I want to be perceived. That's that path. Our theme this year is an effort to try to bring us closer to God via being closer together ourselves. Two people can be very close and not be close to God. A group of people can be very close to each other and not close to God. There's a reason why this entire process starts with drawing near to God. There's a reason why that's the first thing that is mentioned. Because that's the first step. Before we can start walking this way, we've got to, we've got to go this way. We've got to look at Jesus. We've got to draw near to the high priest. We've got to have a relationship with him. We've got to be, as this passage says, you know, sprinkled with the blood and washed with the water. We've got to start the process of having that relationship with God through Christ. And then we can do these other things. So really and truly, this is about, at this moment in time, we... We hit the moment where the sermon's almost over every week, right? And the intention of this moment is self-reflection. 
Now, this shouldn't be the first time we self-reflect. <laughs> this shouldn't be the only time we self-reflect. But this is a time for self-reflection. If you've ever wondered, why do we offer an invitation? And my, my, my answer to that would be, well, it might not be somebody else's answer, but my answer to that would be, like, that's when you give it time to sink in, <laughs> right? You don't have to walk forward for the sermon to have, or for the, not, not the sermon, excuse me, I don't want to say that, for the word of God to sink in. I mean, this, we're starting this process right now. Do I need to draw to God, nearer to God? Is that where I am in this process? Do I need to take my relationship with God and start sharing it with other people through real encouragement? I mean, not just kind words, but real encouragement. Do I need to be focused on spurring, you know, spurring, you know, stimulating love and good deeds? Where am I in this process? And wherever you are, God is here for you. That's the encouraging thing. Speaking of encouragement. God is the eternal encourager. Because of, what, because of only what God says? Because of what God does. Because of what he has done, what he will continue to do, and who he is. That is how we are encouraged. You ever been told it's all going to be okay? And you don't believe it because of all that's happening? We've got people here sitting right in this room who have dealt with enormously difficult circumstances. People of all ages with enormously difficult circumstances in life. No one is going to criticize you if you've ever been in the midst of those things and someone came along and said to you, everything's going to be okay and you weren't so sure. That's okay. Draw near to God. Draw near to God. Talk to someone who you know is living a life that is being led by the Spirit. Pray. Ask for help. And it takes all those things, not just one. Don't try to do it by yourself. This passage, as much about, you know, as much about spirituality is, it's just, it's just as much about togetherness. It's just as much about each other, us helping each other. And sometimes you can be an encouragement, and sometimes you need to be offered encouragement. And both of those are perfectly fine. Both of those are perfectly fine. Now, if you have a need that you would like to share to the congregation, that's where the actual walking up comes in. If you find yourself in that situation and you feel like that we can help you, then that's, then that's fine. We'll give you an opportunity to do that in just about 30 seconds. But everyone has the opportunity to reflect, to see where you are, and to draw near to God. That's, that's my hope for us all today. That we draw near to God, hold on to that confession, so that we can be true encouragements and spurn each other to love and good deeds. If you have something that you'd like to share to the congregation, you can, come, you can do so by coming forward as we stand and sing.